This is Mike Collins, publisher of The Rational Speculator. Joining me today is Martin Turan, president and CEO of FPX Nickel Corp. Hello, Martin. Hey, Mike, it's good to see you. Likewise. Uh, could you provide our listeners with an overview of the news release uh, that just came out regarding carbon sequestration and how it builds on prior results? Absolutely. So one of the unique advantages of the nickel ore body that we have defined at the Baptiste deposit uh, here in central BC is its high content of a mineral called brucite. Brucite is the mineral form of magnesium hydroxide and it's modeled to be in content in the range of one to 2% uh, of the, uh, by weight uh, of the total sort of ore body there at Baptiste. When brucite undergoes, uh, is in host rock that's undergone mineral processing that's taken the particle size of those rocks down to a fine particle, the brucite becomes exposed to air or to uh, CO2 in air and it naturally sequesters carbon dioxide uh, Basically, the chemical reaction is H2O plus brucite plus C CO2 to form a new carbonate mineral. That locks the CO2 away in mineral form in perpetuity in a way that is also measurable and verifiable. We've put out previous news releases discussing this phenomenon, which is observed in practice already at um, the Mount Keith nickel mine operated by BHP in Western Australia. The release that we put out here on November 2nd speaks to the ability of our mineralization to sequester carbon at a much higher rate, a much faster rate, if a point source of CO2 uh, from flue gas, for example, is introduced into the tailings. So the previous test work had shown strong mineralization of carbon in tailings via direct air capture. The new news release shows that that rate and quantum of CO2 capture can be hugely accelerated if there is a point source of CO2 introduced into the, into the surface of the tailings. Okay. So how might the Baptiste project economics be impacted by including the potential benefits of carbon sequestration? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, you know, based on the existing sort of carbon pricing, um, you know, in the mine development plan for, for Baptiste. Um, there's one main source of, of, uh, of carbon tax that's attributable to the project economics. That comes from the purchase of diesel for a diesel fueled mining fleet. Okay, and at, at, at today's carbon price, that accounts for something in the range of, you know, eight, eight or so million dollars a year that the project would have to pay in carbon tax. Um, however, going forward in a higher carbon pricing scenario, which is likely in both in Canada and across the world, that number go up uh, significantly. So to the extent that CO2 can be mineralized, sequestered, captured in our tailings in a demonstrable way, in a verifiable way, um, that can ultimately, we believe, be used as a basis to capture, recapture carbon credits. And carbon credits, depending on how measurable and verifiable and permanent the sequestration of carbon um, it can be demonstrated to be. Uh, carbon credits can trade for several hundreds of dollars a ton. So this is ultimately something that we would see uh, being used to capture carbon credits either back from the government or to sell carbon credits into the open market and potentially see um, a significant net benefit to the project economics you know, that, you know, could range certainly into the, into the, into the, into the millions, if not the tens of millions of dollars, depending on how mm -hmm. carbon markets evolve over time. So potentially a very significant impact. We do see it as a significant impact. I, I think that, you know, in some ways though, the economics of the carbon capture piece here are dwarfed in some respects by the overall project economics, you mm -hmm. know, at the rate of assumed production um, in the PEA, something circa 100 million pounds of nickel per annum over 35 years, at today's nickel price, you're looking at $900 million a year in top line revenue. So the, the, the capture of sort of carbon credits is not insignificant, but again, the very large scale of this project, you know, speaks to the kind of the economic potential here. 
I would suggest mm-hmm. that the main influence of the carbon of any carbon sequestration here is on really reducing the environmental footprint of the project um, and also potentially having this project be a, an important source of nickel in a, in a potentially carbon neutral manner, which matters quite a bit to the downstream participants, both in the stainless steel side, but especially uh, uh, on the electric vehicle uh, battery side. Mm-hmm. But that leads into my next question. So the, the issuance of this press release coincides with the UN Climate Change Conference being held in Glasgow. The focus on the environment and on ESG in general is an important development in the investment industry. How might FPX Nickel benefit from, from this focus? Yeah, we know the focus on uh, particularly environmental aspects of project development are, are significant, and, and that is revol- most of that conversation is revolving around um, CO2 emissions associated with mining, act- mining um, smelting, and refining activities. Now, the main advantage of uh, Baptiste from a CO2 standpoint is that the mining operations, the processing in particular, would uh, would be projected to be uh, on the hydroelectric power grid here in British Columbia, where there's abundant uh, green hydroelectric power with a very low CO2 profile. That lends itself to producing nickel with a very low CO2 uh, emissions per unit of nickel produced. Just to give you a sense, you know, the typical range of CO2 emissions for laterite derived nickel production is anywhere between 30 to 70 tons of CO2 emitted for every ton of nickel produced. Whereas we see the potential here to have emissions in the range of two to three tons of CO2 for every ton of nickel produced. So an order of magnitude less. Um, Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing is that, um, uh, you know, on the one hand, mining companies themselves, the major mining companies are pushing to have their operations be carbon neutral over the next 20 to 30 years. They haven't really defined in a lot of detail how they're going to go go about doing that. However, I think it's fair to say that high carbon projects will have difficulty kind of being sanctioned for development and construction and operation by those companies. They will be focused on green lighting or advancing only those projects that have a low carbon footprint. And so to that extent, we think this places, you know, Baptiste in a very favorable position given its low positioning on the cost curve. We also know that the downstream market, particularly on the battery side, is very focused on CO2 emissions associated with nickel production. And so the ability to produce Nickel with a very low CO2 footprint here is vitally important from a strategic standpoint um, when thinking about the possibility of this product going into those EV batteries here in North America. So what are the next steps related to the carbon sequestration work? Yeah, so we announced in uh, the news release that you referred to earlier, the, the next stages of work are already have already commenced, have already kicked off. This is all about two things. One, it's about taking the work from the lab into the field. So we've already done some field work, released the results of that for, um, in terms of direct air capture uh, earlier this year. We're expanding that uh, work and, and continuing that work. So taking it from the lab to the field is point one. Point two is expanding uh, the quantum of, of mineralization that's being tested. So we're moving from sort of grams to then kilograms, hundreds of kilograms. And the current tests that we're doing now are now at the tons level of mineralization. So as we scale up the volume of material being tested, we can do more different types of testing, understand how conditions, uh, climatic conditions in in the region of our project affect sequestration and just build a better, more robust data set so that as we continue to advance project development, you know, the goal here from a development standpoint is to ultimately incorporate estimates of the carbon sequestration potential of this uh, potential operating mine into the development plan itself, into feasibility studies, so that people can kind of put those numbers, that we can put those numbers into context and people can kind of rely on that with a higher certainty of sort of scientific confidence, if you will. Mm-hmm. Well, Martin, that was uh, very informative. I think it's going to uh, play a big role going forward in the future of FBX Nickel. Um, 
you know, is there anything else you'd like to address or? Uh, yeah, we're, we're yeah, we're saying thanks for that, Mike. So yeah, we're we're excited on the carbon sequestration front. We're we've got a, that's just one very small piece though of, of the work that we have underway. A series of sort of trade offs and engineering studies, metallurgical test work on the main uh, Baptiste deposit uh, that will feed into an ultimate pre feasibility study. And also, just as importantly, is all of the work that we're doing around the van target, where we've just recently announced the new major nickel discovery that's located six kilometers north of Baptiste. And people can expect in the coming weeks to see additional news from additional uh, drill holes that were that were um, put into the van target uh, this year, the, the first ever program, which has already proven to be very successful. So a lot of work on a lot of fronts. And uh, um, as usual, I'm always happy to engage with uh, shareholders. Um, so if people want to get in touch with me, have questions, they can email me at ceo at fpxnickel.com. That's great. Well, thanks. Thanks very much, Martin, for joining me. And for disclosure purposes, I want to mention that I am a shareholder of FPX Nickel Corp. And my company is providing consulting services to FPX Nickel. Thanks again, Martin. Thanks, Mike. Great to see you.